Without reading, we are all without light in the dark, without fire in the cold. Tamara Pierce Welcome to the Kinky Nerdy Polly Podcast. Hello, I'm G. And I'm M. And today we're going to be discussing the Song of the Lioness Quartet by Tamara Pierce. And I am really excited about this because, G, as far as I'm aware, this is one of your favorite series. And it's a book series, and it was your pick for the KNP Nerdy Topic. And you are going to be sharing all about your passion for this book series. And we're going to be giving an overview of the book, talk about the themes in the book, and nerd out about, you know, fiction that impacted us in our formative years, specifically around G's love for this book series. So this, I'm just going to like hand it over to G to start nerding out and give us a summary of this book. Yes, I'm I'm super excited about this topic. This is, Tamara Pierce is one of my favorite authors, and out of everything I read as a child, I'd say that reading her books was one of the most formative parts of my childhood for a lot of reasons, which we'll dive into later. But one thing I did want to do is I did talk to my sister shortly before we started recording this podcast, and I wanted to give her a shout out because she is actually the one who introduced me to the series back when we were children. And she she was the one who first started to get me to read these books, and I really enjoyed them. That is so sweet. The way that I know about these books is less sweet because I was given the, well, I think I was only given the first one, I'm pretty sure by a maybe just the first one but now I'm starting to like second guess how many of these books I had and how many I read because it was a really long time ago I was given them when I was like nine which I think was quite young actually for this series Mm -hmm. um and I was given them by or at least the first one by a neighbor for my birthday and I didn't even have like a very close relationship with that neighbor so I think it's much sweeter story that you were recommended this series by your sister yeah i mean also just as sort of a a consequence of moving around a lot as a kid like we have to share a lot of our media but yeah i still love that she introduced me to this and it is as i said earlier one of it's i'd say it's i'd say the only other fantasy series i might have read before this that i can recall reading is like redwall and even then i'm not sure like i might have so I'm not sure like which one I read first, but this is definitely one of the first fantasy series ever read. And it really, I think, has made a huge difference in my life. And about how old were you, by the way, when you read these books? Oof, I think I read them relatively young because at least the way I remember it, what happened was I had broken my arm. And so I was kind of stuck at home with not a whole lot to do. Uh, and so my sister recommended that I read this book, I think partially because Alana also breaks her arm at one point, and she thought it would be helpful if I was like also reading somebody who was struggling through that and dealing with it. So I think I was, no, no, it's hard to remember what age I was, but I think I, I was like in the third grade, second or third grade. I feel like that's pretty young for this series because they mentioned like, As I was rereading this, like, I feel like the beginning, the first book, you can kind of get away with it. But then as I was reading about the further stories, like, it gets into much more, like, teenage issues. Oh, yeah. I definitely read it before I was a teenager. Yeah. And I think for me, it kind of lost me on some of those things. And maybe that's why I didn't, it, it didn't, I don't know what really lost me in the end of why I didn't pursue it more when I was young, but it could have been that it just didn't like fit my, what I was going through at the time. But I'm curious, you know, we are talking about like, this has a huge impact on your life. But before we get into all of that, what is the general synopsis of the story? So the general synopsis of the series, or especially the first story, is that there is a a set of fraternal twins, Alana and Tom. They are a part of this kingdom called Tortal. And Tom is just, he's supposed to go to the, he's supposed to go and train to become a knight. 
and Alana is supposed to go and start to be trained on how to become like a proper noble lady, which is a fate neither of them want. Alana wants to become a knight, and Tom wants to become a magician. So they decide to switch places, and then we follow Alana as she goes as Alan to the royal city in order to train to become a knight and her sort of trials and tribulations of, you know, hiding your secret and also dealing with the consequences of story events that happen. I guess spoilers for the series, if you haven't read it, I get, I feel like, I feel like it should be implied if we're going to be talking about the series in depth. Sure, but yeah. Let's just make an explicit spoiler warning. Like, I'm going to be talking in depth about all sorts of plot points. So if you want to go and read the series before what before listening to this podcast, I would highly, highly recommend it to our audience folks. But yeah, we're going to be we're going to be talking all sorts of spoilers. So yeah, she eventually like through events, her gender is eventually outed, but she's able sort of through force of arms and personality for society to accept her as a lady knight. Right. And it's you had mentioned that, you know, Alana and Tom are fraternal twins and I had misremembered them as being cousins. So obviously I that was it makes more sense that fraternal twins would do the gender switcheroo. Yeah. Because they're going to look much more similar. Yeah, they or they noted, can look more similar. Yeah. In the in the book, it's noted that they look as children. They basically look identical and you could only really tell a difference because one had longer hair. And also, I think it would have been interesting to see more of Tom's perspective. Of course, it follows Alana's story, but Tom is also trading places with Alana and exploring what it's like to be in the role of the noble lady. No, he, so while he does have to do like an initial switch for like leaving like the, basically their hometown, on the way, the the people who are responsible for Training noble ladies also start the process of training people for magic. Um, oh, right. And he's a very talented magician, basically. Yes. That's right. I remember that. So it was, I think, acknowledged pretty early that Alana was going to have the harder job of making sure the switch stayed in place because basically once Tom was clear of the hometown, he could just go to be Tom, while Alana would have to be Alan convincingly until she became a knight right that makes sense yeah and so another thing like as and i know alana's story is not that of a trans guy's story but even then one of the things that probably did vibe with me even though i don't remember reading all of them and who knows it was a long time ago but one of the things that i remember that the gender bendy stuff does vibe with me because as a trans guy reading this as someone you know, reading about quote unquote girl who is going to disguise herself as a boy and become a knight, even as my younger self, that sort of appealed to me. It has the sort of Mulan narrative. Yeah, in a lot of ways it does. There's it's like, not the same story, but. No, it's it's not the same story since it takes place over a much longer period of time. Right. Though I do think the original Mulan epic, which we talked that about. That actually took like many many years like 30 years or something right didn't we talk yeah. about that in our episode if we were prepared podcasters pied pipers we'd have that episode number we, we would if we were prepared podcasters pied piper but yeah if i remember correctly from when we talked about it like the original mulan poem it's like she goes on like a whole military campaign for like decades before coming back home and yes. so it's a movie which comp which compresses it time-wise. Right. But yeah, this this takes place over a much longer period of time. And I, I do talk about this a little bit later in my notes, but I feel like this is just a good time to talk about it now. It's I One of the things I love about this is that it's not only an exploration of of what it's like to... Uh, to gender bend, to, to explore being masculine as a feminine person. Later on in the series, she also... Because... You know, essentially, you know, as a kid, Alana gets to be a tomboy as much as she wants. And it's really not until she's supposed to be sent off to what's essentially a finishing school that she's supposed to act more ladylike. And so instead of doing that, she goes and trains to be a knight. So after, you know, after some people find out her secret and are helping her out, one of the things that she does is like she gets like a dress and is like, 
trying to learn how to be feminine like much later in life, which is something as as somebody who came out like more trans feminine much later in life is something I especially vibe with nowadays of being like, wait, like how, how, how to walk in dress, which I remember is that despite her practice, there are definitely, there's definitely at least I remember one scene where somebody is able to peg her at a distance, even though she's wearing a wig because of the way she's walking. It's a friend, so there there isn't like a whole lot of consequence to it. But as as somebody who has had to explore how more feminine presentation much later in life, I, I definitely vibe with that nowadays. Yeah, I think especially now that like, I mean, even for I think anybody of any gender identity or expression or whether they're trans or not, can really, I think there's something from Alana's story of exploration for honestly anyone. It's true that she comes from a a certain feminine perspective yes. that, you know, could speak more to women, could speak more to trans feminine individuals, could speak more towards in my, where I was in my journey, like trans, trans guys. Mm-hmm. But I do think honestly, like just, her her playing around with these things and acknowledging sort of like the the discomfort with things that she was like I don't like this sort of thing or I do like this sort of thing and and everybody can play around with those aspects of their gender or to check in with their body and be like oh wait I do like this or I don't like that so I think her story is something that especially because this is geared towards a younger audience yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of aspects that even if even if you don't identify as trans, like I feel like there are aspects that will still ring true being well it's not it's not quite like it's not quite like the modern day high school or college experience. It's sort of being away from home for the first time, the isolation, dealing with bullies, trying to, you know, trying to navigate uncertain social situations. I feel like these are elements that ring true for a lot of people, no matter what your background is. And one area that I I think I remember getting brought up because this was something that I was going through at the time was that she gets her period. Oh, yeah. And she is not happy. Yeah. She freaks out and she's like, nope, this is not good. And this also reflects like people who get poor sex education or poor like they're grow up in like a very body like not not body positive situation, not sex positive situation. She's like. I don't know what's going on and she doesn't really have anyone around her because she's surrounded by men and like she's you know definitely not happy and it's something that like again this is aimed at younger audiences and the author Tamara Pierce didn't shy away from highlighting this experience like this is a bodily experience and it should be described in a novel that is geared towards a younger audience. Yeah, Uh, I really appreciated that. And it's also something that I've seen brought up in fantasy books, but aimed at older audiences. So I've been reading this series called the Lightbringer series. And similarly, there are like sort of knights, if you will, but like maybe more like, gosh, I'm blanking on the term of like uh, bodyguards, like specialized bodyguards. Okay. And they go through really intense training. And so a lot of the women end up having like suppressed periods because they're like, eating like a very restricted diet and they are super yeah. super buff and so because of all of that they basically have suppressed their periods mm-hmm. and some of them talk about getting their periods in the ways that I could see like really vibing with how when Alana is freaking out and she's like what the frick is this but that is geared towards a more like adult audience and I appreciate again that the author didn't shy away from bringing this up in a book that is geared towards a young audience yeah, I think I I love the series not only because I think it's it's a good read and I and I love the world, but I love how the author doesn't like one of the you know express points that the author tries to make when writing her books is that she wants more female protagonists. So she started off with this series, A Song of the Lioness. Then there's the Immortal series, uh, which also has a female protagonist. Yeah, basically, every, I think all of her series set in the Tortal universe have, are are women-led. 
as being like the main protagonist. No, there's actually a re- she recently wrote a book where one where they it's kind of like a prologue where it's the where it's exploring one of the men's backstory origin story sort of thing. Okay, but yeah, most up until very recently, every every series in this universe was woman led and very different sort of female characters. Like Alana is very much sort of a heroic knight, and she sort of through sort of strength of personality, like forces society to accept her on her terms. Diane, who is the hero of the Immortal series, is she's more sort of like, you know, I'm I'm just trying to make my way and sort of becomes a, I don't want to say like an accidental hero, but sort of a hero of circumstance. Mm-hmm. And then there's Keldry of the Protector of the Small series, who possibly might be my, that's, that her series, Protector of the Small, might possibly be my favorite out of, the, as much as I love the Song of the Lioness and all these books, Protector of the Small might be my favorite part of the Tortal universe because it examines the consequences of trying to become the woman, the second woman knight after Alana has blazed the way, but blazed so in a dramatic, heroic fashion where in, in this fantasy universe, she's touched by the gods and she's kind of recognized as being a special circumstance, sort of being the follow-up act and trying to break through the glass ceiling a second time. Mm-hmm. And exploring, like, how she's different from Alana and how isolating it can be to, like, just be constantly compared to this heroic example. And I I, I love, I mean, I love all these series, but, like, I especially have a lot of love for, for Keltry and then the Protector of the Small series. I was also reading something about, I don't know where she comes from, but have you read the the character Becca? Becca, Becca yeah. yeah, Becca Cooper. That's that's another prequel series which sort of explores that's 200 years before Alana's first adventure. And yeah, it's described as from what this author was saying is more prog- progressive in some more progressive in some ways and more oppressive in others and it takes Becca is unlike Alana, it comes from the perspective of a working class person. Yeah, it's a she's a working class person. She doesn't try to become a knight, though there are at at this point in the history of the of the, of Tortal, there are some female knights. It's just they're getting rarer because there's like a, if I remember correctly, there's sort of like a religious cultural change of being like, oh, women should not be on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. But it's still like accepted that women can like do martial activities, just becoming less popular or less culturally accepted for them. Mm-hmm. And so Becca becomes becomes a cop, essentially, though it's not called a cop. They're called provost guards. But there's like a like I think they're known as like the provost dogs. So they all have like nicknames, right. which are like dog based. I think Becca's is terrier and sort of dealing with what it's like to sort of be in the situation where you know, you're caught, at least from what I remember from reading that series, like you're like they have to deal with with like crime but they also have to deal with the fact that they are never going to have enough resources to take down all the crime and also like that they so they have to like there's sort of like a push and pull between like them and the underworld Mm -hmm. and also like you know nobility doesn't care a whole lot about them so yeah i i do remember I do remember really liking that series though it's not it's not quite as burned into my memory as the other series are So I also, while I don't remember this, but mentioned in this same article, which I can post in the show notes as well, it comes more from the perspective of a mother and daughter relationship of someone who really loves Tamara Pierce's novels and is reflecting on her novels and all of her series and how she, how Tamara Pierce puts sex education into her novels. But uh, something that she mentions is that later on in Alana's story, after the you know, the period situation, it gets brought up that there, Alana actually receives a charm that can prevent pregnancy if she wishes to actually have sex. So oh, yeah. I, oh, go yeah. ahead. No, I was just going to say that that actually, like, I don't remember reading that. And I think I was, again, I think I was quite young when I read this. So I don't know if that would have, like, kind of gone over my head, but, or if I would have just been like, 
like this is irrelevant to the story because it wasn't interesting to me. Yeah, from from what I remember, like it's fairly common in this universe to have like charms against pregnancy. Like it's a relatively relatively small and harmless magic, like and relatively easy to do. So most everybody who wants one can have one. So yeah, I I hadn't really thought about it in that way. But yeah, it's it's very clear in the universe that like yeah, any you know, anybody who doesn't want a kid can just like have this charm on them at all times. Right. And I think so what the framing of this article was is that there are some people who read these novels and it was their exposure to sex education. Okay. Um because they might have gone into this series like not having, you know, again, similarly to Alana, who wakes up with a period and doesn't know what it is. And if you're reading these novels at that time, you might be having a very similar experience to Alana. Yeah, it also doesn't it also doesn't ever like I think for a young fantasy series, it's fairly sex positive like there's oh yeah there's several sexual relationships in the story yeah alana gets around a little bit um, yeah and she's and... never it's not looked down on from what i understand yeah nobody looks down on her about it she you know she has sex with the heir to the pri heir to the kingdom and also the king of thieves and she so, settles you know... down with that guy yeah, the King of Thieves. She settles she ultimately settles down with him, even though the Jonathan? Yeah, Jonathan. He's the one who thinks he wa he's like he imagines marrying her. Yeah. But then she says ultimately like it's like her choice and she wants to like see things a little differently and she's like not quick to settle down. And I think that's another good lesson for like young readers is to know that like you don't have to make big decisions in relationships like it's okay to explore uh different relationships yeah i think if i remember correctly when jonathan first brings up the aspect of marriage like a him talking about marriage kind of freaks her out to begin with because like she just wants to become a knight at this point and she hasn't really like her entire mind is like focused on this goal of becoming a knight and like I don't think she actually knows what her life is going to be like after she becomes a knight because she's just put all of her focus on getting to this goal. And so when Jonathan like brings up the possibility of marriage, like that kind of freaks her out because like I haven't really thought like anything past this point. And also when he starts talking about marriage, if I remember correctly, he also talks about her like settling down with him. <laughs> she is like, I'm sorry, I did not just spend all this effort to become a knight just to then settle down and become your housewife. Right, exactly. So, like, these books are definitely infused with, I would say, gender exploration positivity, sex positivity, feminist ideals, just all around, like, great stuff to be exposing, again, younger audiences too, but anybody. You know, I, just talking about it with you, I'm like, I think I should go back and really, like, fully, fully read them. Because again, like even now thinking about it, I'm like, did how much of this did I read? And also I was like nine. So that was like, geez, only almost 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just I, I do think one of the things I always attribute to Tamara Pierce and her books is that I was exposed to at a very young age, the idea that women could be heroes and protagonists. So it never... Like, I've noticed, like, in a lot of nerd culture as I was growing up, that there are a lot of people who would express surprise when, like, oh, like, Wonder Woman's getting her own movie or or whatever. There's a lot of misogynistic crap that goes on in, in nerd spaces. But to me, like, since I read the, I read, like, Song of the Lioness series so early and the other books so early and they were, like, some of my favorite books, like, it never crossed my mind that women couldn't be heroes. And I'm, I've, e even before we start talking about the gender stuff, like as I became a teenager and a young adult, like I became very thankful that this, that Tamara Pierce's writings, like sort of planted the seed of that idea in my head at such a, such a young age. Yeah, definitely. And also, I know that we've talked a lot about Alana's gender exploration. So, Gee, as a gender fluid person yourself, would you like to talk about what Tamara Pierce has actually come out and tweeted recently? Yeah, I, I pulled up the tweet here so I could could read what she said. But this is a 
This is a tweet from 2019. The tweet from Tamara Pierce is, Alana has always defied labels. She took the best bits of being a woman and a man and created her own unique identity. I think the term is gender fluid, though there wasn't a word for this, to my knowledge, when I was writing her. Right. That was back in 1983, right? Or even it would be earlier. It was published in 1983. But she actually wrote this in 1970, and it was a cohesive story. It was actually originally one cohesive novel instead of four books, but she was encouraged to make it into, because it was geared towards a younger audience, to chop it into four. And so, you know, in 1970, we might or might not have had the term gender fluid, but here she is saying and really validating a lot of people who has read, who, who might have read these books and thought, oh, I'm gender fluid and I see myself in this character. Yeah, I think I think it's really validating to anybody who saw the gender expansiveness of her character to have to have Tamara Pierce say this. And and I just I just really appreciate Tara Pierce and her writing. And she 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 made it really like going back and rereading it now, it it hits different for me. And you know, I just I just really appreciate that she wrote this and this this series will always just kind of be a touchstone for me. That makes sense. Like it you were introduced to it by your sister who very sweetly recommended it to you because you were struggling with a broken arm and this character also was struggling going through obstacles and you were encouraged by this heroic female character. The gender exploration really vibed with you as you grew into your own gender journey later on. And I can definitely see how this story really stuck with you throughout your life. Yeah, it's become, I, I call it my comfort read, sort of like a like a comfort blanket. Mm -hmm. Like whenever I'm feeling down, like I can always go back to the series and reread it and I'll feel better. That's so awesome. I think... I have, so when I was really, really young, I got into, do you know those books, the Magic Treehouse series? I'm familiar with them. I don't think I've ever read them. Okay, well, I collected them. They're like very short and sweet. And there's a whole bunch of them. And even like, I mean, I had the whole collection. And I think she's still putting out the books today. Hold on, I'll Google her name because I forget. Magic Treehouse books. They are by Mary Pope Osborne. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because like whenever my mom would see like a new one come out, even like, you know, when I was in college, she would just buy it for me because <laughs> I just loved them when I was younger. And actually a side tangent on that is, you know, I recently started watching Doctor Who at the encouragement of my other partner X. And I was thinking like Magic Treehouse is ba like Doctor Who is basically adult Magic Treehouse. So if you don't know what Magic Treehouse is, it's like brother and sister find this. I think it's a magic book and they're able to use it. They go into their treehouse in the woods and they're able to use this book to magically transport themselves to a period in history. And give me a second. So yeah, Jack and Annie Smith are the character. They um, sort of time travel through history. And they time travel. And so, yes. So you get that, you see little snippets and you learn about like different places around the world and you learn about different like little historical events and things like that. But there's also like some fantasy things thrown in there because at one point Merlin becomes very, very important. He gets his whole series, his whole mini series called Merlin Mission. Okay. And anyways, so I realized when I was wa watching Doctor Who that really... Doctor Who, like the TARDIS is just the the magic treehouse. Uh, that's yeah. all a wibbly wobbly timey wimey. Mm -hmm. And the other series that I think of like that I really enjoyed in my childhood that I would love to go back and read that might be a comfort read for me is like the Percy Jackson series. Mm -hmm. And I was recently talking to Kay, who I remember, you know, our dear friend Kay and beta listener. We'll give a shout out. Thank you so much for beta listening, Kay. And X also beta listens, thank you, who recently, I think, read, well, not super recently, but more recently than I did, read Percy Jackson series. I haven't read those in a long time. And so this whole episode just, like, as I was thinking over this, I was like, this is making me want to go back and read stuff that I read as, like, a little kid or, like, a teenager. And, yeah, just, like, find those comfort reads. Yeah. That's so great. I think that should be our challenge to our audience folks from this episode. 
yeah, go go find something that can be your your comfort read, your comfort media, like what whatever like you know brings you joy. Yeah, that's awesome. This is a wholesome episode. All right. So so one last thing I want to talk about, which is slightly outside the scope of the the initial book series, is that one thing I do appreciate about Tara Pierce's writing is that it shows that that making any kind of systemic change takes constant effort. It doesn't happen overnight. So like I said, you know, in in the Song of the Lioness series or, or quartet, you know, Alana becomes the first female knight in a couple hundred years. You know, she sort of breaks the barriers. The follow-up series, mortals, like it's following a sort of different person who's in a more sort of lowborn position. But I really think in the in the third series, uh, Protector of the Small, really sort of examines like what kind of efforts it takes to actually make systemic change and how it takes sort of constant effort to make positive systemic change. Like I said, there's Keltry is trying to become the second woman knight, which she encounters all sorts of barriers. There's also dealing a lot with what I guess I'd call like systemic institutionalized bullying or hazing and how it it takes a, it takes concerted effort from a lot of people to change how an entire institution thinks about a process. Because like hazing is, you know, tacitly accepted, not only in Alana's time, but up into Kel- into uh, Keldry's time. And of course, with Keldry being, you know, the second woman to try to become a knight, he gets like, in- like intensely hazed, like much more than anybody else does. And it sort of shows that like this kind of institutionalized hazing has like the tacit acceptance of everybody from like the head of the school down to the students. And so to like to make that kind of like to make a change requires like it requires a lot of people to put in a lot of work to like change how an institution thinks about its processes. Absolutely. So you would recommend, G, as much as you love the Alana series, as an adult reader, you would recommend the, can you rec- uh, say the series name again? Protector of the Small. Protector of the small. Okay. And that's with the Kel- Keldry? Yeah, with Keldry as the protagonist. Okay. Yeah, I have, as I've gone, like, I, I love all of Tamara Pierce's work. At least I haven't read anything so far, which has made me like, I don't know about this. Like everything I've read so far, I've loved. But Keldry, while she's not, she doesn't explore like her gender in a way that Alana does. I feel like her personality is a lot more like mine. She's sort of pro- pragmatic and a little bit more stoic. And she also, she has the, she's also a diplobrat. Though, of course, that term doesn't really exist in the in the fantasy world. Like, she grew up overseas and was, like, the daughter of an ambassador. And so when she comes back, she's considered, like, a stranger, a foreigner who who is just weird compared to everybody else because she grew up with different cultural customs. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And she, you know, she has to put up with a lot of of shit because, like I said, like Alana's, you know, treated like because Alana is the first in a couple hundred years. And also like because she's also like one thing we don't talk about a lot in this episode is Alana also like she can also do magic. She just doesn't do it as much as her brother does. So, you know, she's magic. She's a knight. You know, she goes on, like, this quest to, like, get this magic artifact for the king. She, like, helps unite the kingdom with, like, this, this is, like, ethnic minority in the South. She is, like, a, 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 a capital H heroic character. And so, like, one thing that the Protector of the Small series examines is, like, you know, a lot of people can, like, be like, well, yeah, Alana can be a knight because, you know, she's special. But, you know, that doesn't mean we have to change your attitudes towards women. <laughs> like, women should still be protected. Alana's just special. And, you know, Keldry has to put up with a lot of shit with people who don't want her to succeed because they don't want the status quo to change. And, you know, and she does it in, like, the most, you know, tenacious, pragmatic way possible. It's really interesting. I'd be very curious to read that. Yeah, I would I would recommend it. I mean, there's, there's very few. I don't think there's any books by Tanner Pierce I would not recommend. But, yes, I would. Highly recommend Protector of the Small and Song of the Lioness as I'd say like my two favorite series in sort of the Tertal universe. Thank you so much for sharing your passion with us today. Of course. This was very informative. Learned a lot about you, G. 
So please, if you enjoyed listening to G share their passions about Song of the Lioness Quartet and other Tamara Pierce novels, share this episode with your friends, families, lovers, and anyone who loves good fantasy adventures. Yeah, if if, if you like hearing me talk, you can also and, and talk about this my passions and Anne's passions when we when we talk about stuff that he likes. You can donate using the link at the bottom of the show notes. This is M. This is G. Don't be afraid to love how you love. Love what you love. And love who you love. If you'd like to get in touch with either M or myself, you can tweet us at KNP Podcast. You can find us at knppodcast.tumblr.com. Or you can email us at kinky.nerdy.poly at gmail.com. I got my paper accepted that journal. That's good. I it's funny. Like I found out I didn't get that grant, and then I find out that I did get accepted that journal, which is really funny because it's like academia. They're not willing to pay me, but I can write in their journals for free. Academia, where life is a nightmare. <laughs>